Babylon, 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 Babylon. Babylon. This is a Mog Morgan for the Egyptian Magic Podcast. Uh, recording all the speakers for the forthcoming Thelemic Symposium. Uh, and today I'm talking to uh, Dr. Halo Quinn, uh, who is one of the speakers for the, the sort of speaker bit of the, of, of the conference coming up and probably going to contribute some other things as well. Uh, so the first thing I always ask thing is, can you tell us a little bit about yourself, you know? Um, who you are and uh, who you <laughs> no, no, who you are and you know what you're into and uh, you know what you do just anything <laughs> you want to share with us really sure I feel a little bit like Alice encountering the caterpillar on the mushroom who are you uh, which perhaps as a response tells you everything you need to know about me um, so like my, my tagline I'm a pagan author I'm a storyteller um, and I'm a witch. Um, I'm an initiate of a particular witchcraft tradition, um, and I have been practicing for a few decades at this point because I started young. Um, so I've explored quite a lot of different paths, but my my heart really is is in the witchy the witchy spaces. Right. Um, and I have a, you said doctor, I am actually not a medical doctor, but a doctor of philosophy. Um, I did my PhD in the phenomenology of storytelling. So. Right. Where was that? Where did you do that? At Bristol or? No, Lampeter. So I live in West Wales, yeah. uh, well, West Mid Wales on the West Coast. Um, and I went to university I, to do philosophy about almost 20 years ago I turned up here and took a while after I finished my undergrad and went straight into to doing a long long PhD at Lampeter, Lampeter upon Stefan, right. a little place in the middle of nowhere. Sure but are you, have you, are you of a Welsh background then? Do you come from Wales? Not originally, um, I have family that came from or that, that live in South Wales that are sort of you know that area i originally for my sins um was brought up in swindon so uh, oh yeah <laughs> <laughs> yes someone's well, got to be <laughs> well that's it that's it i see swindon's i don't know about swindon but i know swindon quite well because that's the from, i live in oxford now i'm actually from wales myself right uh, i don't know if you guessed that but obviously to get to uh avebury Avery seems to be kind of just outside Swindon as well. We're not very far, yeah. you know, go around there. So I know I've gone around the Swindon bypass, wherever that's called, that kind of uh, weird roundabout that they've got many, many times. Okay. Well, that, that, so just to, to Avery was my, my stomping ground as a kid. So we used to go there at least w probably once a month yeah. um, and, and, small climb on the stones um shh, don't don't tell anyone um but yeah so when i when i actually found my way into paganism and magic i made a regular uh regular trips down there through all the way throughout my teens and one year i went and camped in the stones for every one of the the neo-pagan festivals right. um, and stayed overnight for all of them except one because it was it would have been dangerous to do so because it was so cold and wet um I can't remember which one that was now, but I had to hitchhike home, which was quite fun. So yeah, Avebury is is one of my favourite places. Yeah, and um, it's so on the doorstep, isn't it, for Swindon? Really? Yeah, yeah. it was about a twenty minute bus bus journey. So yeah, perfect. Yeah, it's brilliant. Well, what can I ask you about your name, H Halo Quinn? It's sure. Is that a kind uh, of magical name or a birth name or? so it's a magical name it's a nickname um halo i acquired when i went to my first I, it was about a week after i turned 18 and i went to my first um 
reclaiming, so the, the tradition of witchcraft, reclaiming uh, witch camp, which was an intensive seven days where we were working with the story of Keredwen and Taliesin, funnily enough, part of the reason I ended up in Wales in the end. Um, and at the door, I had like an online name and my, my legal name and, and at the door they said, you know, so what, what name, what should we call you? Because I know you've got multiple names. Here's your name badge. What, what should we call you? And it just fell out of my mouth. Really? It was just halo. I was like, okay. So, and it stuck ever since then it stuck. And it's just sort of been, it's, it now feels more like me than my, my legal name does. And then Quinn um, came when I was started writing books and I needed a surname yeah, and it just sort of the the archetype of the Harlequin, um, in its positive aspects, but also that that bit of trickstery, yeah. um, that really resonated with me. Is the light and the era. color. It's a it's a very interesting archetype, isn't it, the Harlequin? Mm. Brilliant. Yeah, I I, I I think that's fairly obvious from the name that it must be important to you. But yeah, great that you say that. Okay, so. We're taught you're appearing at the uh, Thalamic Symposium. I, I ask everybody the same, exactly the same questions, incidentally. Can you, obviously, Thalamic Symposium, the first thing is it's connected with uh, Alistair Crowley, of course. Can you, can you tell me what you think about Alistair Crowley, what, what your approach to him would be? Uh, I know it, you say come from a witchcraft tradition, because there's kind of quite a lot of the witchcraft tradition in, in Britain that has this sort of double life really connection with Crowley as well I used to go to this Gnostic mass in London that was run by Gardnerians for years and years so but what what do you think what do you make of Alistair Crowley first I, I'll ask you about the the philosophy after that as well but ma <laughs> as as a person as or as a whatever a magician or a prophet or a I don't know uh, or the wickedest man alive or the wickedest man alive <laughs> you know <laughs> well, he's he's kind of fascinating. So, uh, like, I there's this element. Okay, so we're going to come back to the the Harlequin at this point and the storytelling, the performance. There is very much an element of the way in which he lived his life as a performance, and the the PR and the publicity and what have you. That's performance as art. He was creating an enchantment if you want to put it in in sort of really nice nice terminology he was he was casting a spell um so i find that really fascinating i mean obviously i don't agree with with everything that he said or did because really? <laughs> you know well no one's going to agree with everything that anyone said or uh, everything that anyone has said or did but um you know he had the, obviously some very problematic um elements but generally speaking, I think that he embodied his philosophy as best as any human being can and was genuinely striving towards like being the magic that he believed in, being the magic that he was connected to. And I like find that quite fascinating. Um, but there's also this this element that there are pieces that and somewhat deliberately so he's very misunderstood in some ways because there are so many layers so much he puts so much of himself out there that there's contradictions and there's things that look like they're one way and then actually may actually be the other um so it's it's quite a you know a trickstery kind of figure in in one respect he's a trickster and a tricky figure <laughs> yeah Maybe I, I wondered whether kind of in the past that men kind of related more to Crowley than women did, although he was very popular with women in his own time, according to his own accounts anyway, and, and whatever. He seems to have done all right, but but looking back, right, like, um, men kind of seem to very much relate to him, partly because, I don't know, he's there's something about his personality and also the sort of, adventurous life he, he, li he lived and uh, I often think well, would you say that or you, 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 it, as a woman you know do you find that he, him a difficult character in in that sense as well so 
And this, this starts to become tricky because I'm a queer woman. I'm not I'm non-binary internally, even though I like I've moved through the worlds um a AFAB, um assigned female at birth, you know, like and seen, I'm very much responded to um in that mode. Um and I think that we're lucky at this point in that people are really publicly exploring what those two categories of man and woman mean and where the lines are really blurred and I read a really interesting piece that was looking at the the, the queerness of Alistair Crowley mm -hmm. and how actually in some of his writings he talks about being neither man nor woman and being yeah. something other in between so yeah, do, yeah you again see. then you were you were talking I got some of it about an interesting you're right an interesting element of of Crowley that he was mm. I don't know nowadays he probably would be you call him pansexual or gender fluid mm. certainly interested in that uh kind of boundary between the sexes and he had a kind of female persona mm. thing and he's a, in some um, um, go on yeah in some <laughs> communities he's a sort of hero you know the gay community he's a pioneer mm. of uh sexual revolution i suppose you say but go on and i think I, I think we always have to be careful about um, assigning anyone like hero status in, in any direction. Like we're all deeply flawed individuals and Crowley, well, wore his flaws on the surface. Um, and that, that like, I do think that that's an interesting piece, his, his bisexuality, pansexuality. Um, but also, like, I think you're right in that historically, many men have identified with him because he played the wickedest man alive the beast the you know and he sort of like strode through the world embodying that kind of power that has been traditionally recently associated with men of a certain status and certain wealth and certain um one of my friends uh, reminded me he was part of the leisure class Crowley was part of the leisure class like so he had a very particular space um so yeah I think there's been a lot of identification with him in in that way from blokey blokes magicians who wanted to have that kind of sense of power and the freedom and wealth and space and throughout history this has been somewhat of a somewhat of a thing um in that generally <laughs> in the wealthier classes it was the wealthy people and it was the men who had the space to go off and do the things or they could go and be monks and go off and have a spiritual life separate from things and then where there was money like the women were running the home and where there wasn't money well you had men and women all working they didn't have time to go off and do those things so actually like when we start to look at the the gender thing and where people are like identifying with and it was the men that were the magicians as i were a part of that is it's the wealthy men that were the magicians and when we get really down to it the the divisions stop being so much about gender and start being more about money um at a very base level um but yeah, and I don't think, and I think that part of the reason that um, you won't get very many women identifying with Crowley, per se, is because of all the blokes that have done it up till this point and gone, no, it was a bloke's bloke, and you know, so like, but why? A bit. <laughs> yeah. Blokey yeah. interpretation, maybe. Yeah. Anyway, and plus, you, you know. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. Well, look, move on to. Mm -hmm philosophy right S separate from him uh known as Salema, which is was given its name to the symposium which is a, a kind of either you say he channeled it or was part of the team that channeled it a particular view of uh, magic have you got any thoughts on that on Salema itself separate from crowley yeah so um i mean who doesn't have thoughts on it let's be <laughs> honest i i think that that so when i when i've told told friends it's like oh i was invited to come and speak at the the international thalemic symposium and i've like my first response was but i'm not a thalamite and when i've said this to friends of mine they've all gone yeah but 
aren't you? Yeah. And and I sort of so I reflected on it. I'm like, okay, I've I've had an interest in in the philosophy of it. I've had an interest in the magic. Magic has always been my thing. Like I'm I, all the different forms of magic and techniques and, and structures. I love the the practical side of it. Um, but I'm a, a, an initiated uh, initiated um, fairy witch, so Anderson fairy, F E R I, um, and we hold very very similar philosophy. And I was reflecting on this and thinking, well, actually, like that, do what thou wilt is the whole of the law. Love is the law. Love under will. Like that, that whole piece, like that crops up in so many places, and it just makes sense to me, like in in my tradition um we talk about like what is the work of this god so what is what is my work what is my and i'd say like my my heart's truth or or whatever you know like what is my work in this world if i am here manifesting my divine self well that's you know what is your true will it's the same mm -hmm. question yes. um so yeah, I, I really like the, the philosophy and I like some of the, the trickiness in the, the nuance around um, will, like, well, what is my true will and how does that impact on other people's true will and how are we following true will in community um, and not knocking the other stars off course, um, as they say. So yeah, all those pieces, I really like it. I, th I think I'm right in saying that you're part of um the star club yeah um if we can talk about that uh is so that I'm, what is that is that a thalemic organization or is that a kind of witch's coven or a magic no How so, is that? so star club star club i co-founded star club in its iteration as it is now with um seth salem so seth had developed a, a structure now seth's a thalamite um and he developed a structure from ceremonial magic but wanted it to be independent of that and syncretic and to bring together like lots of different things but he was missing parts of the puzzle um, so when we started talking in 2018, 2019, like, wow. you know, yeah, a few years ago now, like he immediately went, oh, you know your stuff. And we worked together on the syncretic elements of it. So Star Club is first a, a training program. It's like a, a, a temporary pop-up um, kind of a pop-up order if you like in its first iteration so we run cycles and you've got nine sessions and you come along and you form a, a working magical group and you go through these things and Seth and I run those sessions and we're just about to start training other people up so that they can take over so that it's not just us that are running it so it's the whole group and we work through different types of magic within a, a, a shape now there are thelemic principles at play underneath it because of course as I said like Seth's a thalamite and in my tradition like what is the work of this god like that do what thou will is the whole of law like that that is sort of pretty resonant um, pretty core even if it's under different different words so it's got that core to it and then if people finish the the cycle the 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 group the working group um training group that dissolves but then people have the option to join the e um dr bob Plimmer called it a, a modern magical order so they get the option then to actually join the, the the star club which is kind of bigger than the training program um and provides space for for people to to continue on their work and to share that support in each for each other and to do magic together this like that's great. the primary thing yeah this seems to be the modern way i think this kind of whatever you call it a pop-up or rather than being kind of a slave it's got to last forever mm. but you know i think people come together and they do this is great i think okay well look um you're selected go on 
I was going to say, and and also um, this this point where at this point in history we have um, a, in in the culture where I am anyway, um, we have access to so much information, yeah. and we can see where all of these different paths, these different magical traditions in the Western magical sphere, where they grew out of each other, where they influenced each other, and where all the similarities are. And this is what I find fascinating about like Star Club and about symposiums and conferences is when we get together and we start looking at well where do our paths intersect where do they connect up and where are they different because there's some some places in which those the the viewpoints the perspectives that we're coming in on um are so different that like it's like okay well how how do these pieces fit together and i think that's part of the the modern way as well we don't have to have you know be the in the wealthy echelons in order to do ceremonial magic anymore we can get the books i've got like shelves full of books you know um and have access to those tools but we also don't have to go that way yep. we can look at where they all match up and where they connect this is great okay so let's um you're you're on the roster speaking about uh encountering babylon a phenomenological i got it right <laughs> you did very well most of, so, so it's about <laughs> babylon can you tell us who who babylon is i might know well, it's better if you tell us <laughs> so so that's kind of the point of the paper yeah um so babylon the stock answer is that Babylon is a modern Thelemic goddess with ancient roots mm. um, and she is variously known as the mother of abominations and you know all of those things um, goddess of uh, sex life death um, and sometimes people will actually mention like she's also the goddess of, of the earth or a goddess of, of earth in the sense of earthiness um, so yeah that's that's kind of the stock answer right so without giving too much away so that's that's who babylon is and you're you're talking about encountering her so i mean i don't want you to give a really good it's interesting fascinating subject but what does that mean the phenomenological if i got it right inquiry mm. what what yeah. exactly does that that mean okay so and this is this is why like this is the question of the paper phenomenology is is the philosophical tradition that like my my roots are in really um and it basically starts with a couple of principles and i'll, I'll go over this in more depth in the paper but it's yeah, the not, idea that not sorry, much now right don't give it all not, away. not so much now an idea but it's it's sort of founded on the principle that rather than being skeptical about things or rather than everything being subjective that actually there are phenomena in the world that we can encounter and as a polytheist and a pagan like when i started reading about babylon i'm like okay so she's a phenomena that i can encounter like you're a phenomena that i can encounter um now phenomenology is kind of that that point where subjectivity and objectivity uh meet because we have to when we're talking about things we have to talk about our subjective experience of it but there is an objective thing there like what does that mean and this is where it gets all tricky and harlequiny um and paradoxical which i love so my through describing encounters with her and then analyzing these now uh, you'll see in the abstract i mentioned parmenides in ancient greek philosophy parmenides actually got like he wrote up a philosophy of like the natural world based on a vision that he'd had of the goddess mm -hmm. yeah so the goddess of, of nature the goddess of the world so i'm like okay well if parmenides can do it so right. can the rest of us right so let's go and 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 I, I will do a little bit of talking about other people's visions like crowley's visions of course because this is one of the ways in which we um 
there's there's a lovely term called unverified personal gnosis, which is, you know, gnosis, knowledge that you gain that is personal and unverified by other people. It's like personal to you. But then the next step of that is verified personal gnosis. And that's the point at which what you've gained some knowledge through your experience. Uh, this comes out of reconstructionist um, paths through your experience of deities, for example. But then other people have independently experienced that as well. And so what is it like? Oh, you It's not in the law. It's not in the books. But your community is all experiencing these things. Well, maybe you're actually meeting that god or goddess. And so this is what the paper is going to explore from a philosophical perspective as a practitioner. Wow. Quite an unusual approach uh, and, you know, quite unique, I think. It's going to be great. Thank you. Oh, okay. So. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure it will be, I can tell. Um, so so to wind up then, um, do you want to what's uh, do you want to say as uh, what's the future for you what what's the next project without mentioning other events or anything like that but <laughs> you're working on a book and you've got a book tell us about your your projects you know for the my future. projects well so i've got i've got eight books out my my last one was crimson craft and that was out last january that's about sexual magic for the solar witch and it has a bit about babylon in it um the next one that i've got coming out is out in january on storytelling for magic because i love using my voice and using stories and the way in which that weaves into magic but um my main project along uh, alongside star club which we've got a new cycle starting next february is the Enchanted Academy, which is my home for my magical programs. And um, this month, I'm actually starting a new course, Elements of Eros. So again, this ties in with the, the Babylon work in that in this, the, in this program, in, in a lot of my work, I'm trying to make space for people within like a, a pagan and a magical context for us to find that safety in our bodies in that sensual erotic space that runs through us that connects into magic which so many of us have been divorced from um like just just because the world is is as it is um we tend to go into like the mental we, we're in our computers all day we're discouraged from being sensual beings and so like coming back into that space within a ritual and a magical context so elements of eros is working with the elements to root into that and as uh, part of writing the the paper i'm also creating music for babylon so i've got the first couple of songs um for blood and roses which is the musical project are out um and they're an invocation to the 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 red goddess and then specifically like casting the circle for babylon um and so this is part of how i've been working with her in the last you know year or so is by creating these musical pieces um what i most of my my like natural singing is quite folky um but these are really industrial um you know my friend called described them as dark wave music so you know like quite strong heavy beats which really suits suits that that energy so yeah the the main the main piece is, is the enchanted academy yeah this is great okay so yeah uh, uh fantastic taster of stuff to come and also for the the talk that's coming up very soon um uh, i think unless you've got anything else to say i think we're we we've given it a good going over as they say uh so thank you for appearing just remains for me to say uh do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law and love is the lord love and the will indeed thank you for having me and um hail babylon